Okay. Uh, I want to uh, do the last part of this lecture on cultural balance syndromes in the Western world. I have been picking on the rest of the world. I've been picking on Asia and Latin America especially. But, you know, guess what? Uh, you know, we also, as Westerners, have plenty of culture bound syndromes. You know, it's easy to, to pick on other people and pretend to be superior, but in actuality, we've got some real, real doozies here. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of the Western ones. And I hope you're going to learn about something you didn't know before. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting one, idiopathic postprandial syndrome, sometimes known as hypoglycemia, but apparently not. Uh, it's a collection of clinical signs and symptoms similar to medical hypoglycemia. You know, hypoglycemia is low blood sugar, uh, but without the demonstrably low blood glu glucose levels. So if somebody acts like they have low blood sugar, or they me measure the blood sugar, their blood sugar is fine. People with this condition suffer from recurrent episodes of altered mood and cognitive efficiency. And they don't think clearly, often accompanied by weakness and uh, like sort of adrenaline rush, like shakiness. Episodes typically occur a few hours after a meal rather than many after many hours of fasting that you would expect. Principal treatments recommended are to give them extra small meals or snacks and avoidance of excess simple sugars. They change the diet, that's how they deal with this stuff. Okay? Could be related to the body's production of adrenaline, could be related to emotional stress, we're not quite sure, it's not well studied. Um, but this is something that's really quite interesting. So this, is, this is, again, would be an interesting thing. It's typically only found in the Western world. You don't find this. You go to Vietnam, you don't see people with this. Okay? It's found in the Western world, developed world. Okay? Um, and I just got this new article. Uh, they, they've done a little research on this. This was in 1994 or something. Uh, Postprandial hypoglycemia associated with beta and... and, and ugh, I can't say anything. Adrenergic hypersensitivity and emotional distress. The idea is that people may be emotionally stressed, but they're also uh, genetically predisposed to being hypersensitive to adrenaline. And that may be what's going on with this. So again, you know, people have done some research. A newer study came out, said no, that, we don't think that's what it is. So, you know, again, they're still trying to figure this out. So really another fascinating, another good one for a doctoral dissertation, but only found mostly in the West. My favorite one I want to talk to you about is hysteria and neurasthenia. This relates to attacking nervios, these kind of things, uh, nervous breakdowns. Uh, neurasthenia and hysterical syndromes, uh, fatigue, anxiety, headache, neuralgia, weird pains, uh, and depression. Okay. Americans in the 18 and 1900s were supposedly so excessively prone to the syndrome that it was nicknamed Americanitis, that you found it's mostly in American, among American women. Okay. There seems to be researches of this condition, uh, and it's still commonly diagnosed in Asia. Like that anger sickness, those may be related to this kind of thing, okay? So what's going on with this, right? So Freud talked about this, um, this sort of hysteria. And Freud included a variety of physical symptoms, fatigue, dyspepsia, which is probably digestion, flatulence, indications of intracranial pressure, spinal irritation, etc. In common with some people at the time, he believed that this condition was due to non-completed coitus. And Freud famously gave the prescription. Right? You guys know about this? Freud's famous prescription? Rx, which means prescription. Rx, penis normalis. This is what he prescribed for some woman who came in with him. Rx, penis normalis. Okay, so that's where that comes from. Um, if you're a feminist, you maybe got yikes, right? You're going to see that in a minute. Um, Freud's day hysteria typically involves somatic symptoms such as paralysis of the arm. A lot of Freud's famous cases, the people would come in, their arm would be paralyzed, there was no physical cause, and he would then psychoanalyze them, and some uh, thing would come out. Some they would have some cathartic experience, something coming out, some secret coming out, sometimes around incest. Uh, um, sometimes, uh, and uh, and then they would they would get better, and so it became known as uh, hysterical neurosis. Now in the DSM you'll see it as, as conversion disorders. It's much rarer now that people have these, these physical symptoms, but in Victorian times that was common. Okay. So this is a very, very interesting um, thing. And there's an article in the New York Times about uh, is hysteria real? And they did some brain imaging and people have this and they say they can see changes in the brain. Really quite fascinating. So lots of, lots of theories about this. I'm going to give you my favorite one. And then at the end, I'm going to tell you to take it with a grain of salt, but I'm going to give you my favorite one first. Um, and by the way, we're now seeing more neurasthenia in Asian cultures. 
So as Asian cultures become more westernized, the, the, these places become more you know, like the West, uh, we're seeing more of these sort of Western culture-bound syndromes sort of emerging. Okay, so again, you can read this paper, really quite interesting. Um, so this woman, uh, whose name is Rachel Maines, did her doctoral dissertation, and she wrote a book uh, from her doctoral dissertation called The Technology of Orgasm, Hysteria, the Vibrator, and Women's Sexual Satisfactions. And so um, she looked at hysteria and neurasthenia back in the day and um, uh, came up with this conclusion. The purported disease and its sister ailments display a symptomology consistent with the normal functioning of female sexuality, for which relief, not surprisingly, was obtained through orgasm, either through intercourse in the marriage bed or by means of massage on the physician's table. So she did a lot of research and she found that women would go have hysteria, these hysterical symptoms. And um, in her viewpoint, these hysterical symptoms are basically women, how can I put this in a clinical appropriate way, that these, these, these are due to women being really, really horny because they don't have an orgasm. And so what they would do is either if they could have good sexual relationship and have an orgasm, and they could cure themselves of the symptoms, but if they couldn't, because people were very uptight sexually, and men, especially during that period of time, were not really attuned to satisfying a woman uh, sexually. That was not important, the idea a lot of these sort of Victorian times that sex was basically for reproduction and you just got it over with as quickly as possible. Um, this left a lot of women unsatisfied. And so what happened was, according to Rachel Maines, is that the medical profession uh, figured out a way to fill in the slack here. And what happened is a woman would go to the doctor with all these symptoms, and the doctor's treatment would be to, um, how do we say this, manually manipulate the woman uh, to help her achieve an orgasm, which would have all sorts of medical terminology used. They would create an orgasm, they would call it, they would, they would manipulate her until she had a paroxysm and her symptoms would be resolved. And uh, you'll see, uh, you'll see uh, images like this with the woman on the table where she is being manually manipulated by the doctor until she has this uh, paroxysm and then she's able to go home. Her symptoms are relieved for a while, but of course the symptoms are going to come back and so she'll have to come back again. And so again, you see these kind of things, these, these, these pictures here, the doctors um, you know, using this sort of massage technique to fix people. There was a recent movie that came out where they, they depicted this as Victorian doctors massaging the woman here to orgasm. But they wouldn't call it orgasm. That makes sense? So this is a crazy thing. And then supposedly what happened was is that um, the doctors were doing this. It's great for your practice because you're going to get these women patients are going to keep coming back, right? Because, of course, they're going to get horny again, right? It's normal human female sexuality. They're going to need it again. They're going to come back. And so you got a good practice. The one problem was, and, and supposedly the reports of the male physicians who were performing this, sometimes also performed by nurses too, by the way. Sometimes the nurses would perform this. Um, and when you see reports from the physicians and the nurses, according to Rachel Maines, that they did not find this to be, this was not uh, a purient thing for them. They were not getting their sexual jollies from doing this. The male, mostly male doctors were not getting their sexual jollies from doing this. So that was just a job and a good way to keep your practice going. But there was a problem with it for them. And that is that, of course, women are really variable in how long it takes them to have an orgasm. Some women it's difficult, some women it just takes a long time. And the hands were getting very tired. And they were getting hand cramps and carpal tunnel syndrome and all sorts of stuff from, you know, you know, my practice, Who, who's coming in today? Well, you've got your seeing five patients today. Oh, God, my hand, my poor hand, right? So um, this, uh, this, this was alleviated by the introduction of uh, devices. So around 1900, 19, early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1800s, um, uh, things were invented uh, that were very helpful to the doctor. The thing that was invented was an electric motor. People started to be able to use electricity. Batteries were already in use. Batteries were very big and bulky. They shrunk down size. We started to have electric power delivered to houses in the early 1900s. And, um, and, and people invented electric motors. By the way, uh, electric motors have been interesting types of motors. Um, first type that could be introduced was the DC motor, direct current motor. Later on, the, the alternating current motor was uh, produced, which really has a lot to do with our whole society, how our whole society runs. And the alternating current motor was invented by Nikola Tesla. But Tesla was one in there, the alternating current motor. 
Just so you know about that. All you do is take the motor, the motor spins, right? All you have to do is take a shaft, attach it to a motor, make it a little out of balance, and when it spins, it will vibrate, right? And so some uh, smart person thought, you know, maybe instead of using hands, we can invent a way to vibrate. we be able to do this easier. And so the vibrator, the electric vibrator was invented. And the electric vibrator started out as a medical device. It was costly, expensive. It would be like going to the doctor now, and the doctor has a, you know, an MRI machine, you know, or, a, or an ultrasound machine. And I was talking to the guy, the ultrasound guy, the other day at the doctor's office. Got a new ultrasound machine, eighty thousand dollars for that machine, about this big, you know, big as a small desk computer, eighty thousand dollars. The vibrator was like that kind of thing. It was a medical instrument was really expensive. You had to go to the doctor's office because it was big and bulky. It plugged into the wall, huge big motor on it. You go to the doctor's office, and the doctor would use the electric vibrator instead of having the hand and getting his hand and getting carpal tunnel syndrome. He could just take the woman on the desk, vibrate away and she would have her paroxysm probably more quickly, and um, it would save time, you could see more patients during the day, you could make more money, everybody was happy. Everybody was happy. Um, but then something else happened. So I'll read this quote before I tell you that. The rel this relegated the task of relieving the symptoms of female arousal to medical treatment, which defined female orgasm under clinical conditions as the crisis of an illness, the hysterical paroxysm. In effect, doctors inherited the task of producing orgasm in women because it was a job nobody else wanted, including the men, the women's husbands. Because again, at that time, they were not, you know, it was not, you would consider women. You consider women the woman's pleasure. Okay? So the doctors inherited this task. What happens is, in the 1900s, um, you know, as, 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 as happens with cell phones, remember the first cell phones were these big, huge things, right? Look like a military walkie-talkie thing, right? The first cell phones. Now you have a cell phone that's like, you know, tiny and it's got like the power of like, you know, a, I mean, five computers, NASA computers from 1960. This thing has probably a thousand times more power in it, right? Well, the same thing happens to vibrators. Technology improves. The motors get smaller. Battery technology improves. This is something people don't know about. Uh, but battery technology really goes, really makes a vast improvement from the 1800s into the early 1900s. You guys may not realize this, but you know, you know how we used to communicate back in the 1800s? You wanted to send a message to somebody on the East Coast? How do you do it? Telegraph, Morse code, telegraph, beep, 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 send over wires, okay? Where was electricity for that? We didn't have a power grid back in those days. Cool. You couldn't plug things in, there was no coal. Coal didn't produce electricity. Nobody knew, how to, nobody knew how to make coal into electricity because you needed an electric motor for that, which the reverse of electric motor is a generator, right? Water wheel. So, water wheel, but you didn't have anything that would produce electricity. How did you get electricity for the telegraphs? Batteries. Huge effing batteries. Batteries the size of this room that were, that were, that were, that were you know, electrochemical. You plates of metal with some sort of, you know, uh, um, conductive substance, you know, sulfuric acid or something between the plates. You have huge batteries. The batteries would be the size of this room and they would have to be constantly maintained. And that's what provided the electricity for the telegraphs, right? So batteries started out being the size of this room, but over time, new materials, better chemistry, shrunk down, down, and down. Now to the modern day where you have lithium ion batteries packed together and they, you know, running Teslas up and down the road, right? And battery technology, by the way, is the one area where um, people are really, really, really seeking to increase battery technology because it is the, it is the single biggest um, problem that we don't have more electric cars, for instance, because the battery technology is, you know, we're able to get like, you know, maybe 200, 250 miles in a car, you know, of range, and people would love to increase that to 500 miles or 1,000 miles, and that is because of the battery technology. And there's a lot of research going into battery technology, even still to this day. Okay. But in the, by the 1900s, the battery started to shrink down. And by, you know, once you get into the 1900s a little further, what happens, batteries shrink down even further, and batteries start to become really tiny. Tiny to the point where you can take a vibrator, and electric motors also shrink down. Electric motors shrink down, batteries shrink down. What can you do? You can make a vibrator that no longer needs a doctor's office in a giant room or a plug-in thing, and you can have a battery-powered vibrator that can be sold women really quite cheaply and they can have their own home vibrator they no longer need to do the creepy thing which is to go to the doctor's office to have an orgasm imagine if you had, had to have an orgasm you had to go to the doctor's office that would be a little weird and creepy and of course people at the time you know they knew that you know they were people they knew it was a little weird and creepy 
even though it was putting all these sort of medical terminology over it. And so once vibrators became portable and cheap, it basically ruined the practice for doctors and women started getting their own vibrators and they could, they could use the vibrator in the privacy of their own home. And so the, that part of the medical practice uh, stopped happening. Yes? What's going on with the top right? It looks like so, uh, top right, before, uh, before, um, before they had uh, <coughs> mechanical vibrators, when the doctors were still having the hand techniques, um, they were looking for ways that they could um, uh, produce these paroxysms in women. And so another thing that would happen is that women would go off, this, oh, you suffer from hysteria, you would go off to, um, to a, a resort, you would take the baths, you would go off on a, uh, you would go off and, and uh, they would prescribe, well, you need to go to the sanitarium. And we'd send you off the sanitarium. Now there's different kinds of sanitariums. They had tuberculosis sanitariums where they'd send you to some warm place where hopefully you, know, you could recover from tuberculosis. That didn't work out really well. Uh, tuberculosis was another common problem people had in the day and it really wasn't really dealt with well until we, we had antibiotics. But there are other kind of sanitariums where you would go and um, you would go, uh, back in England, you would go, um, you would go take the waters in a place called Bath, that's where our word bath comes from. They would have hot springs and you go lie in the hot springs. This case goes way back to Roman times. You go to the hot springs for your health. So people having hysteria, women having hysteria, would go to these kind of uh, resort sanitarium places. And one of the things they decided to do, well, you know, we could can, we can try using water at the resort place. We'll take a woman, prop her in a chair, direct a stream of water, toward the, um, toward the uh, uh, appropriate parts and produce the paroxysm that way. And of course there are diagrams that this actually, people drew of this actual happening. Um, so this is another way that they, were, they would treat, they would induce orgasms in women in a sort of quasi-medical um, uh, circumstance. So obviously this, is, this would not happen in an office because it's too messy, too much water everywhere, but if you went to the spa, this could happen. If you went to the spa, the resort, this could happen. And so this is another common thing. Um, but the vibrator basically, uh, you know, gets, gets uh, miniaturized and, um, and uh, revolutionized. It no longer becomes a medical thing. Okay. Now, I will tell you, though, uh, that um, it's a great story, right? Did anybody know about this before this class? Did you all yeah. learn something new today? Oh, you knew about it? Oh, okay, there you go. You gotta, you gotta, also got to be one in the crowd, right? Um, <laughs> So she published this book, her thing, and she became a professor. She's a professor somewhere now. And um, some other people came and looked at her research, and they said, yeah, we're not so sure how well this research was done. And they took real uh, umbrage, sir. So these two people, uh, Holly Lieberman and Eric Schal uh, Schatzberg um, at Georgia Institute of Technology, wrote an article where they basically went through the book, Technology of Orgasm, and they critiqued it and looked at her citations. And basically came to the conclusion like, yeah, we don't think this actually really happened. And then there's a quote, Baines added, she was a little surprised, uh, and, and, and she read their paper, and uh, she was quoted after reading the paper, she said, I was a little, a little surprised it took so long for other scholars to question her argument, given how admittedly slender the evidence she gave in the technology orgasm was. I thought people were going to attack it right away, but it took 20 years for people even. People didn't even want to question it. They liked it so much they didn't want to attack it. I have to plead guilty. I like this lecture so much because it surprises and shocks people. I've been giving it over the years without really looking at her work critically. Okay, but I've, I've, now, I've now remedied that by telling you that not everybody believes it. Um, my feeling is that there may be some truth to some of the stuff in the, pay, in, in the book, and it may not have been as quite as widespread as she makes it out to be. I mean, I, I could go a little bit, I, I think there's probably some evidence that this was practiced in some places by some doctors, but I don't think it quite was, she doesn't really give a lot of evidence that it was as really widespread as, as she makes it out to be in the book. And by the way, in the book, she really does make it sound like this is really widespread. You know, she's, she's you know, the argument that, oh, I was just, these are just hypotheses that I presented. That's what she said. Well, these are, I just presented a hypothesis. I wasn't trying to prove it, but in the book, she says, no, this happened. So it's a little more than a hypothesis. So I think, I think they've caught her a little bit on a little bit of academic dishonesty. Okay, so anyway, so just so you can take that with a grain of salt, whether this really happened or not. I think this would be a really, really, uh, really interesting area to study in more detail. You know, really get in there and study the stuff in more detail and find out, does it really happen or not? So again, if you're interested in this, something else you could do in grad school. Okay, let's talk about multiple chemical sensitivity really quickly. This is basically what you think it is. 
Uh, you've heard about this smoke, many types, pesticides, plastics. Uh, pesticides I've included with being sprayed in the fields here. Synthetic fabrics, cinnamon products, petroleum products, paints. Symptoms can be either nausea, fatigue, headaches, many other vague and nonspecific symptoms. The diagnosis is controversial. They've done double blind control group studies on this and they've shown patients react to placebos such as air at the same rate as suspected triggers. So, you know, this is one I have, I have mixed feelings on this. Um, I worked in a place once where somebody complained about uh, carpet off gassing and said it was causing all these physical symptoms and cost the, the university I was working at many, many thousands of dollars to mitigate and had to do all sorts of things for this woman because she had some diagnosis of this and, and I think it was pretty much 100% psychosomatic. On the other hand, I've driven into work, I used to have a convertible, I drive into work and they use planes to spray the pesticides out there and I get a blast of the stuff going across my car and I just feel crappy and ugh, I don't know if it was psychosomatic or not, but it certainly scared the crap out of me. So I don't know about this one. I think this is again one that, you know, in some cases it could be psychological, in other cases it could be physical. And I don't think this has been really quite, quite, um, quite teased out yet. You know, we're finding out more and more things. We know, for instance, pesticides now, we, we know there's more things that um, happen uh, because of pesticide exposure. We also know some of the pesticides are, in fact, there's one pesticide used out here that's derived from a gas that was used in World War I for warfare. So that's being sprayed out here. So, you know, I, you know, I would want to, like, look at the specific instance rather than just make overall general sweeping uh, conclusions about this, personally. Morgolan's disease. This is a rare disease where people get these kind of uh, lesions and uh, ulcers on their, on their skin. There's no known, uh, at least among medical professionals, no known cause for this. It's thought to be psychosomatic. It's only found in the Western world. Other people say, I don't know if you examine it, you can see like these hairs in there. This must be some infectious organism. Um, this is one, again, it's really quite controversial. There's a whole morgansmedicalcenter.com thing you can go to and you can read about this. People really think this is a real thing. People actually do get the lesions. Uh, the most famous person who supposedly has this is Joni Mitchell. You know who Joni Mitchell is? She was a really famous singer in, back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And supposedly she's like in her 70s, 80s. I don't know if she's, she died or not. Uh, but she supposedly had this. And then when she got this, she sort of stopped going out in public and that kind of thing. Psychosomatic? Is it, so is it supposed to be caused by like, stress? No, it's supposed to be caused by some undetected organism. I believe that's the case. There's some undetected organism or infectious agent that's causing this. And Western science isn't able to identify it yet. That's the one thing I've read about. It. Um, uh, but probably stress has something to do with it. Probably some psychological, at least, component to this. Whether or not, even if it's not purely psychological, there might be some psychological component. <coughs> By the way, lots of infectious diseases have psychological components. You know, people, your immune system you know, takes a dive when you're under stress, so you're more susceptible to, to be infected with things. Yes? Is this a disease where people think they see, like, fibers? Yeah, from? yeah. I heard they're, yeah. they're looking into a connection between this and uh, Lyme disease. Yeah, Lyme disease is the other one that, um, especially if it's undetected initially, can all sorts of can become quite serious problems people can have. And some of the symptoms will overlap with this and other things as well. So yeah, everybody's looking at Lyme disease. So if you have some weird thing going on with you um, and you go to the doctor, it doesn't hurt to ask them to do a Lyme disease. They can test for it. It doesn't hurt to ask to do that. So I would recommend if you have some weird thing going on, you're not quite sure what's going on, weird symptoms, chronic fatigue, whatever you might have in the doctor's office, ask them to give you a Lyme disease test. Because we do know Lyme disease, and some people can go undetected for quite a long time and cause some very serious problems. And we have it here. I have a friend, a colleague here, she was walking her dog up in Ohio and she got Lyme disease. You know, she had, but she had the characteristic target shape thing, and so it was easy to identify. Not everybody gets that. And so, um, so yeah, if you have some, it's, it's, it's testable. You can test to see if you have that. And if you get Lyme, if you know you have it, then you can start taking antibiotics. And even then, it can take quite a long time to, you know, before the symptoms can resolve. So it's, it can be a very serious thing. So you have to take it seriously. Um, but yeah, this could be people, yeah, it could be Lyme disease, it could be something, yeah. Supposedly they see these fibers, but then the doctors don't see them. Right. So that's the thing. Okay. Uh, one of my other favorites, alien abduction. So again, something only found in the West. You don't find this in the 
part of Africa or in uh, uh, Siberia or in, uh, you know, down in Papua New Guinea. You know, field people would get, people are not reporting being abducted by aliens. But in the Western world, in Western Europe, America, North America, you will find people claiming to be abducted by aliens. And um, a psychiatrist from Harvard named John Mack, who my dad knew, um, decided he was going to study this, and he got a bunch of these people together who supposedly were abducted by aliens. And he hypothesized that you know, they had personality disorders or something going on. He interviewed them, examined their cases, tested them, and came to the conclusion these people are very normal. And so from that, he concluded that, you know, maybe we can't just dismiss alien abduction as something being false. Maybe there is something real to it. And he published this. Harvard took great exception to this and said, uh, we're going to fire you because this is a crazy theory. And he said, nope, I've got tenure. And went to court. And the court said, no, he's got tenure. Academic freedom. Say whatever he wants. And so he, he was not able to be fired from Harvard. Uh, now, he's formed his own institute, the John Mack Institute, he's still go to. Unfortunately, he was killed in an auto accident. He was hit by a car or something, he died. Uh, but this is a very interesting, uh, very interesting syndrome. I can show you some examples of this. Let me see if I have a little time to talk about this. Um, While researching my books, I've personally investigated hundreds of abduction cases. But one man's story truly haunts me. His name is Jesse Long. He claims to have been abducted many times since he was a boy, and the abductions he describes are terrifying. If what Jesse tells me is true, then there is a very surprising future in store for all of us. Jesse, when do you first recall being abducted? My first abduction occurred in 1957, when I was five years old, in Rogersville, Tennessee, a very small town in Upper East Tennessee. And my brother John was with me at the time. We came up on what appeared to be a round hat, almost under construction. And one man, a taller looking figure, he had a rod, a long rod in his hand. A light was emitted from him, we were paralyzed. It is at this point that Jesse Long's conscious memory of what happened ends. He says it's only through hypnosis that he's been able to remember the rest of this first abduction. <laughs> what you are seeing is actual footage of Jesse undergoing hypnotic regression. I remember being taken into the craft, taken into one room. I was placed on a very cold, flat table. My brother was separated and he was taken into another room. Some have dismissed the object as simply a shard of glass. 
the way that was analyzed at the Southwest Research Institute, the materials analysis facility in Texas, the conclusions suggested a greater mystery. According to the lab's report, the object revealed a very remarkable composition and exhibited unique surface characteristics that cannot be explained and that the questions outnumber the answers. Okay. So now you're all sufficiently <coughs> frightened that on your no, way home no. you're going to be beamed up into the ship and of course the obligatory anal probe is going to take place, right? Some of you may be familiar with the South Park episode where Cartman gets the <laughs> anal probe. By the way, one of the best South Park episodes oh, okay. ever. It's, I think, in the first season. Yeah, it's, one of the first season. Yeah. Yeah, it's really good. So, um, what do you think is going on here? I mean, do you buy this? Do you think this guy could have, this could have possibly happened? I mean, you know, he's a little kid, you know, he, his brother had happened to him and his brother at the same time. It wasn't just him, you know. Uh, his brother, what was his story? What do you think is going on here? And you got some implanted in him, you know, what's going on? I think that guy, he did something he wasn't supposed to do as a kid. Like, he broke something and caused some massive damage and then it was something in his leg and he's like, no, he yeah, didn't. Hold that thought. That's interesting. Yes. Um, but apparently an indicator um, of kind of like an underlying, I guess in the sense like trying to cover up maybe possible child abuse. Yeah. Yeah, so my theory about it would go along with you guys saying that like maybe he was went down, there was some guy building a weird house and he got molested and then what you do as a little child, especially, is that you try to make meaning of these things that happen to you. So, you know, in order to deal with the trauma, you make a story around it. Unconsciously, you make a story around it. And remember I talked about kids who have dissociative disorder, the multiple personalities, how they have to sort of, you know, dissociate themselves from the, the trauma. And so this could be a form of dissociation as you make a, a story about it. Then you're able to encapsulate the trauma and then go on and develop normally otherwise, especially if it only happens once or something. Right, but you, so you make a thing around. I mean, he gets molested. Him and his brother get molested. They make the story around it. He enables them to encapsulate that, put it over here, and then develop normally. And so my theory is that a lot of these alien abductions, this is what's gone on. There's been some sort of thing like this that's happened to them. They're able to sort of compartmentalize it and then move on. Um, it's my theory. I have no proof for that, um, but I think I think it, it makes some sense. Um, so I had another example too. Another, there's another really good one um, because a lot of times the um, the abduction will include some sort of sexual stuff. So, uh, John Edward Mack was born in New York on October 4th, 1929. In 1955, John graduated. Oh, I felt scared because I've never seen such a. Person. So this was a situation where a bunch of. Uh, little girls at a school all felt like they were being abducted. So it was kind of a sort of form of mass hysteria. Not just girls, but little boys and girls. So it was a form of mass hysteria. So the children, their parents, and the teachers still suffering from shock. John, who essentially specialized in child psychiatry, devoted a great deal of time to interviewing the children. Something scared you, is that right? Is yes. It, what, what scared you? The noise. What noise? The noise that we heard in the air. You heard a noise in the yes. air? What was it like? Like a roar or a buzz or a hum or what kind of a noise? It was like something was blowing a flute. It was scaring myself. It was scary because you saw something yourself? Yes. Mm -hmm. I saw a little object hovering. It was quite big actually. And then there was little ones all around it. We saw something silver and then we quickly ran to the loud to the logs and we saw a silver, silver thing and we saw a man standing next to it. And what was it, what did it feel like when he was looking at you? I felt scared. It, it felt scared? What was scary about it? Well, I felt scared because I've never seen such a person like that before. Did you see the eyes? What did they look like? They were on the like where was the pointy part? Was the pointy part in here or was the pointy part up there? Up there. And what was this? So you get the idea here. So these little kids. And by the way, a lot of people who have these support these alien abductions, they report seeing aliens looking very similar. 
So is this because there really are aliens and they're really similar looking or because one person reported this and now everybody sort of knows what aliens are supposed to look like? So lots of questions about this. It's really quite fascinating. Um, you know, there's reports for women who claim to be impregnated by the aliens and then have alien babies and the babies are taken away from her. You know, all sorts of these kind of things. But you've got to think about this logically for a second. These are things, you don't find this in other parts of the world. You find this mostly in the Western world. If I were an alien, I were going to come down and abduct people. For instance, would I come to the United States where we have a gun-obsessed culture, everybody's got an AK-47, you know, a couple hand grenades, a couple Glocks in their closet. Would I really come here and start abducting people? No, I think I'd probably go to a place where there, people didn't have as many guns. And I might go like to Siberia, you know, way out in the middle of nowhere. I might go to Africa or, you know, some undeveloped part of India you know, remote rural China, you know, these are places if you're really going to go and you want, you want people to know about, what, you know, you abducting people, those would be the places you'd go. You wouldn't go to North America. Everybody has a gun, half of them are high on meth, you know, really? They guess you're going to shoot at you, you know, I mean, yeah, so again, you start, if you start digging in, I mean, on the surface, these stories seem very frightening and compelling. You start digging in, you go, wait a minute, there's some real logical inconsistencies here, okay? Lots of logical inconsistencies here. So there's something going on here. But my guess is, personally, my guess is it's not aliens coming down and abducting people. There may be something going on, but it's not aliens. At least in my opinion. I could be wrong about that. If you don't see me next week, <laughs> and you hear I've been taken up in the ship for an anal probe, you know, okay, you know, I, I was wrong. But I am I am very, very skeptical of this. It's quite fascinating. Yes? Regarding the first example where the guy had something in his leg, yeah. and they're saying it could be a piece of glass, but it had a weird texture, doesn't the body try to eat away at foreign objects? Like if you get a splinter and you leave it, does yeah. it try to like... What it'll do is expel the splinter. You know, Some stuff it will expel more than others. Glass, maybe not. But my guess is, if you're, again, so logically, so I'm an alien. I want to track you. I'm going to experiment on you you know, probes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to put a chip in your body to track you. First of all, why would I put it in your leg where it's going to cause you pain and you're going to be aware of it, you know? I would stick it somewhere like a chip or something, you know, in your skull or something. And there have been cases, by the way, where people reporting having these chips in the skull and had them removed and analyzed supposedly at some, you know, some lab somewhere in the middle of, oh yeah, this is like an alien, you know, you know, metal, you know. But I'm going to put something in you I wouldn't put a sliver of something that looks like a sliver of glass. I would put like some sophisticated transmission tracking or re data reporting mechanism. Is it possible they have technology that's so far beyond theirs that it just looks like a broken sliver of glass? That's possible, but not likely, right? You know, or I put something microscopic that could be easily detected. You know, again, it makes no sense that they put something that looks like a broken sliver of glass. You know, it makes no sense whatsoever. So again, you know, when you start looking into the logical inconsistencies, these things really start adding up, right? They really start adding up. So again, you know, I take this one with a grain of salt. Now, like I said, you know, I'm going off to a conference in Las Vegas. I'm driving on Highway 15 in the middle of the night out in the middle of the desert. And suddenly, you know, the ship starts hovering above my car. You know, they beam me up, you know, for the anal probe. You know, I will eat my words, but until then, I'm going to say culture bound syndrome, only found in the West. Um, the idea that human beings can um, compartmentalize stuff, and again, that is my sort of possible explanation for this. Um, I'm not saying, by the way, that, um, as I told you last time, I'm not saying that I believe that aliens are actually coming down and abducting people. And I, I, but I'm also not saying that I'm not believing that they're not coming down. Um, it is very, you know, who knows? Um, but I will say that um, the two things that really speak against uh, alien abductees, there's two things right now that we know of as human beings, and that is um, uh, really come from physics and astronomy. First of all, the laws of physics as we know them now really seem to preclude some sort of faster than light travel, which would be really, you know, uh, related to the first point, or the second point, which is that the universe is a really, really big place where we live in, and things are really, really far apart. And, um, you know, on, on, the, on the orders of, you know, uh, we use light years as the, as the, uh, as the, as the basic unit. 
and one light year is the year is is how far light would travel in a year and light is very fast and the idea that to get across you know the galaxy the universe uh, you know even just to the next solar system you know we have to go many many light years and so the idea that there would be a civilization that's advanced enough to be able to traverse this distance given the known laws of physics you know seems very very unlikely okay on the other hand it's also very likely that there are other forms of life and there are other you know civilizations that is you know much more likely but whether or not they could ever get here seems very unlikely so those things you know the way we understand physics right now would sort of perhaps uh, argue against the you know the reality of aliens that come down and abduct people and if aliens were really able to you know have the technology to traverse across the galaxy uh, why would they be interested in coming down here and doing anal probes on human beings you know they, they have a lot of they'd be so far advanced uh, from us um, that to wonder about this now um, you guys know the very famous astrophysicist Stephen Hawking who died recently um, he came out before he died and said that we shouldn't be sending signals out into space and letting these alien guys you know if they're out there know where we are because if they're advanced enough to get here the likelihood of their treating us well is probably pretty uh, pretty small you know it'd be more like when you're at a picnic and the ants are crawling around you're like you know it's going to be more of that kind of relationship than a relationship of equals and so he's warning maybe we shouldn't be sending all these all these signals out in space you know just in case now um, you know there's all sorts of speculation about faster than light travel it's quite fascinating some people think that this um, this could be a possibility that will eventually know enough in physics to be able to warp space-time and you know basically you know travel long distances through sort of a you know a man-made black hole and people are talking about these kind of things and making wormholes through space and there's lots of speculation there's tons of science fiction about this if you're into you know either Star Wars or Star Trek you'll know that faster than light travel is almost a staple a necessary staple for um, for any sort of science fiction where people are moving around the galaxy because otherwise things are just impossibly big and you'll talk about transgenerational travel you know we'll stick people on a giant starship and people will live in that starship for three generations before they get to the nearest possible inhabited planet you know things like that it'll take 150 years traveling at some fraction of the speed of light to get to you know some place that possibly could have a planet um, those kind of things are talked about and people have talked about actually doing those kinds of things uh, whether those will actually happen in real life or not we're finding out now just in studying this is a little bit of a side but just in studying like the idea of going to Mars we're finding out now that um, that human beings don't do really well in space that lots of physiological changes happen to the body um, in space people are um, exposed to high levels of radio uh, ionizing radiation and so risks for cancer and things like that go up the longer you're in space and even going on a trip to Mars which would be like a year or something where people are really starting to wonder you know is this a really good idea so this is all being played out and that's some very fascinating research you know that um, astronaut guy who was married to the congresswoman who got shot Kelly I think his name is Kelly he has a twin brother and the twin brother stayed on the space station for a year and the, and the other one stayed on the earth and then the guy came back and they've been they just published a um, uh, the results of comparing their the, the the physiology of the two astronauts one on earth you know identical twins one on earth one in the space station and it's a fascinating read you know they, there's some summaries of it out now and there are a lot of things change in his body and not not for the better being up in the space station for a year and it gave him a chance to do sort of a controlled experiment because they have these identical twins and uh, being up there is not really good some of the stuff is reversible once they get back down to earth and some is not and so this is something that's out there now if you're interested um, I think Wired magazine had an article on it recently it's really quite fascinating so this is all to say that alien abduction probably in real life probably unlikely and I think you know a simpler explanation is to maybe look toward human psychology explain these things and this idea that I had I'm giving you these people be able to compartmentalize some sort of traumatic event and then of course 
the human brain with the great imagination is able to make that into something that's more palatable. Okay? So I think that's my feeling, probably what's going on. But again, you never know. Right? You never know. So if you're driving out, you know, toward Nevada out near Area 51 in the middle of the night and suddenly see a light and it comes in and, and you know, shines down and suddenly you're being transported up into the spaceship, you know, I hope that you will be encountering aliens that are uh, deciding not to give you anal probes or to have sex with you. Maybe they just want to chat. Oh, hopefully that'll be good. Um, you might suggest going down the road to the diner and having a cup of coffee, hanging out. No need for any probes of any type. And I think you'd be better. Okay? All right. Any questions about alien abduction? Yes? Do you think that pe some people under, like, we? Some people use alien abduction as a story to like gain fame, because I feel like a lot Yeah, of I'm sure there are people out there who say they've been abducted by aliens who just made up the story, you know, to get attention. Yeah, I'm sure those people are out there. Those people are out there for everything, by the way. And we don't talk much about them in class other than when we talk about malingering and, um, and um, uh, okay. uh, Munchausen syndrome, you know, I mean, people who are doing stuff because they, you know, they're just making stuff up, right? Human beings make stuff up all the time. They lie about everything, you know, you name it. That stuff to me is a little less interesting than people who actually believe these things that happen to them. But yes, of course people say that. Now I had a colleague here who shall remain nameless who um, actually told me he had an alien encounter experience. He wasn't an alien probe, but he had an encounter with a UFO and he really believes that that's what happened. And I asked him to give me a list of the drugs he was on at the time. And he said he couldn't remember what ones he was on, but he was sure that it was real. You know, I had another friend of mine who, um, this is back in the day when I lived in the commune, who uh, took a bunch of Datura, you know, Datura plant. We have a bunch out here. Don't take these, by the way. It's su super dangerous. It'll make you hallucinate. And he took a bunch of Datura and was high for three days and was convinced that the aliens were going to come down and pick him up. And got all his stuff, packed his stuff, went to the top of a mountain and waited there. Because he was just absolutely convinced the aliens were going to come and pick him up. And then after three days of sitting on top of the mountain, that didn't happen. And he was very disappointed. Um, but, you know, again, you know, there can be certain influences that might affect whether or not a person believes, you know, these kind of alien abduction things may happen. Now it's in the media and you know about this. And so, you know, because we're so suggestible, something weird happens to you and you, oh, that must have been an alien abduction, right? Again, if you're out in the jungles of Vietnam, you know, you don't find people who believe they've been abducted by aliens. Okay? But, you know, because they haven't heard about this. Now when they hear about all this stuff and it's on TV and they're watching, you know, the Discovery Channel's, you know, thing about, you know, alien abduction, you know, because it's going to get to the, you know, out in the country of Vietnam, you know, we might start seeing people reporting these things. So again, you, you can't underestimate the suggestibility of human beings. That should be a theme of this class. Right? It's the main theme here. Okay? How gullible we are. All right? Right now I'm taking the, the is it like in the universe class? And yeah. we just got to the part of like, because earlier in the class it's all like, oh, is there alien that could be like in like robes and maybe we'll find like that kind of thing. Yeah. And we just yeah. got to the part where it's like, what if there's like higher intelligence, like ET type stuff? Yeah. And they were saying a lot of the same stuff. I'm just like, if they came back down to the biggest prevalent theory that they're not, they don't care about us, we're just sort of like backwoods aliens, or the other, the other one was, how would you feel if you saw like a squirrel with an AK 47? You wouldn't want to go near that thing. Yeah. <laughs> we have nuclear weapons, we can blow each other up, and they're yeah. just like, mm. yeah. They're going that near but they got to get here, and getting here is just impossible. Now, by the way, microbes, on the other hand, is very plausible. Yeah. And there's actually some evidence that microbes can, you know, like, for instance, like when the giant meteor hit the Earth 65 million years ago and killed all the dinosaurs off, when that happened, it ejected dirt essentially up into space. It hit so hard, and that dirt would have had bacteria on it. Some bacteria, some of those microbes could survive the vacuum space, and then it goes on and drifts for thousands of years, millions of years and ends up going into the atmosphere of Mars, you know. So that there's some evidence that that can happen. The idea that, you know, comets can come from out of the solar system may have, you know, crashed into the Earth carrying, you know, microbes. It's one of the ideas of how life got started on the planet here. So that is a little more feasible. When you talk about microbes, things are a little more feasible. Um, but, you know, intelligent beings, higher beings, you know, you have to travel here sort of purposely. You wonder about that. Okay. All right, lots of interesting stuff. You can go to the website, johnmackinstitute.org. You can read about this stuff. Lots of interesting examples online. 
Um, so I'm going to leave that there. Okay. Uh, let's go and talk about uh, uh, another Western culture bound syndrome that other people in the par other parts of the world do not seem to suffer until they become westernized. Two very common uh, issues, anorexia uh, nervosa and bulimia nervosa. These are very common, uh, very life-threatening uh, illnesses. Hopefully nobody here has had to deal with these kind of things. Um, I've had a number of students over the years who've been diagnosed with these, and luckily the students I've had here who've had this have overcome it, which is great. Very happy to hear that with lots of therapy. Therapy works very well here. All sorts of uh, behavioral programs can work. And so um, these things can be treated and people can get better. Uh, but these can be very serious illnesses. And people, uh, especially young people, can die of these things. Okay? You can starve yourself to death, literally. And I'm not going to go into anorexia and bulimia and uh, give you a DSM thing, because you're going to get all that when you take um, Psych 313. Uh, but these, you, you know, what, basically you guys all know what these disorders are. Uh, bulimia is where a person has a pattern of, of binging and purging, binging on food and then purging themselves. Bulimics tend to be normal weight, rough, you know, on average. Uh, and then you have anorexia, which is more dangerous, which a person just sort of starves himself to death. They feel like they're fat. They have a maybe delusional image of themselves, uh, but they actually keep losing weight until the point, to the point where they can essentially starve themselves to death but they're delusional, they think that they're fat. My dad says this may be related to sort of a body kind of psychosis, a body hallucination. Um, and other people, psychoanalytic people have written about that. Um, very dangerous. But interestingly enough, <clears throat> these uh, disorders do not seem to occur in, uh, in, in outside the Western developed world. These seem to be disorders of Western westernized developed nations, first world problems. Okay, if you go again to the jungles of Vietnam, you do not find people who suffer from anorexia. You find skinny people, and in fact Vietnam, I'll use as an example, they have some of the most uh, skinniest people on the planet. They um, tend to have uh, fewest, one of the fewest percentages of obese people. And by obese, we're roughly, we're roughly, um, saying people with a, a body fat index, a BFI of 30 or more. That's roughly about when you start saying people are obese. Uh, you find some variation on that. But you know, you want to use your body fat index, about 30, 30 plus, you start talking about people being obese. Okay? Um, you'll find very few people who are clicking and classified as obese in places like Vietnam. you find very few people who starve themselves to death uh, having an anorexic disorder or an immune disorder. So this is thought to be a Western culture-bound syndrome. If you're coming from China, you're coming from Vietnam, you're a psychologist, you're studying culture-bound syndromes, this is probably, you know, the person who's teaching at the University of Vietnam is teaching the version of this class is probably talking about culture-bound syndromes. Other places, he's going to put this up and say, yeah, look at those Americans, weird, huh? You know, they've got this stuff going on. Um, and anorexia and bulimia are kind of uh, culture balance syndrome that kind of point to uh, other problems with uh, 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 first world countries and especially about our, our, our relationship to food. We have a very bizarre relationship to food here. Okay? Um, and maybe the, that relationship to food is feeding into these kind of things. Also relationship to, um, to uh, uh, idealized images. You know, the fact that um, that uh, Mostly women, but men too, you know, are subjected to idealized images in the media of uh, idealized body shapes, which are probably much thinner than, uh, than the average, okay? And you guys know this, you live near LA, so you see this all the time. You know, um, you see people who are presented in the media, you know, uh, women are often, women and men are presented sort of these model physiques where they're just very muscular, very skinny um, models. Uh, female models typically have to have a, be very skinny, they have to be very tall. Uh, male models have to have a certain sort of physique, a certain look to them. And these are probably unrealistic for most people. And yet those are held out as ideals of beauty. Ideals of beauty change over time, okay? Uh, but right now in our culture, these are sort of the ideals of beauty. So a very thin woman with a huge chest, um, who doesn't eat very much. And so this, some of these kind of media-driven um, 
beauty ideals may be feeding into things like anorexia, bulimia. Um, family dynamics probably play a role. I mean, I'm not going to get much into it in this class, but again, if you take 313 from me or another professor, we can get into some of the family dynamics going on in the anorexia experience. But again, some of these family dynamics may be related to the fact that these families are in the Western world. And it's a very interesting. Um, by the way, if you think you might be suffering from either of these, or you know somebody who suffers, might be suffering, you suspect they might be suffering from anorexia, maybe you have a roommate who, you know, seems to go and stick her fingers down her throat after every meal, um, please tell somebody. Because again, you know, people your age die from anorexia. Okay, this is something that people actually die from. So if you know, if you, you suspect somebody has this kind of thing, you know, please, please, most strongly encourage them to, to get some help, okay? Because it can be treated, and it can be treated successfully, and, um, and proof people don't have to die from this, okay? But it's very, very serious. Let's talk about some other things that people die of. Uh, the opposite, and that is obesity. That um, Western first world countries, we, um, we tend to be very obese. And probably a living example of this, right? You know, I'm a person who's had to worry about and deal with weight issues my whole life, right? I'm sure some of, your other, some of the rest of you have had this experience. Um, this, in my mind, is much easier to explain than why you only find anorexia in the first world. Obesity is, is a much simpler explanation. Um, I'm here in campus. Let's just say I get in my car. I drive into Camarillo. What's the first thing I start seeing when I, I say I drive up uh, a Lewis Road here, going into Camarillo? I'm coming into town right by Ventura Avenue. What's the first thing there on the corner? The meat market is there, yes. There was Rocket Fizz, they closed now. But what, even right before you get to that, what's there? That donut spot. Donut shop. Uh, yeah. Okay? Donut shop. Donuts. Okay, this is, this, is, this is a good example of the problem that we have. Um, now I'll get into this. What else do you see? So I drive into Camarillo. What else am I passing every 50 feet as I drive through Camarillo or any other city in America? Fast food, McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell, Pollo Loco, Popeyes, you name it. KFC. My kid asked me the other day, he said, hey, Dad, I've never had KFC. And I go, there's a reason for that. <laughs> I really, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, you know, much what Dr. Baker would call horrible from his apparent. But the only thing I'm not convinced <laughs> about is fast food. I will take an in and out burger every now and then because the fast food places, it's one of the better ones. I don't want to say it's, it's, it's necessarily better for you, but at least they, there's some attention paid to the ingredients. I don't think they've got like beets and, you know, chicken buttholes in their ham, ground up in their hamburgers, you know, like, like McDonald's does, by the way. Um, you know, which, by the way, when you're eating McDonald's, you should know, I mean, McDonald's is some of the other places. Uh, so, but, 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 so, so we're, we have fast food here. What are the characteristics of fast food? High fat content. A lot of sugar. A lot of sugar. And a lot of what? Salt. Oily fatty, sugar, salt, right? So you got to think about how our bodies were designed. Our bodies were designed via natural selection. Human, human hominids emerged on the plains, the savannas of Africa. They came, you know, our primate ancestors came down from the trees, you know, walked upright, developed different behavioral strategies, was very successful. Um, but our diets were very, very um, uh, different. Right? What were you eating as primates? You're mostly eating fruit and trees, things like that. Um, primates, you know, tend to be kind of scavengers. Uh, you know, they might have eaten a little meat, you know, every now and then. Um, when we, when hominids came, hominids would probably eat largely a plant diet with periods of, of sort of feasting on meat. This is, and this is what some of these new fad diets, like the keto diet and the, the paleo diet, try to sort of mimic. There's lots of problems with this, by the way, which I could talk to you about, because people back in those days lived in maybe 30 or 40 years old. So, you know, you didn't have to worry about cardiovascular health or these other things because you're going to die off by being eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> and so, you know, the long-term things of keto diet, paleo diet, <laughs> you know, the logic is not. I mean, you know, there might be some good things about those diets, but the logic is is a little flawed. 
for those diets. Yeah. Great. If you only want to live to 30 years old, great diet. You know, um, you want to run 10 miles a day, live to 30 years old, great diet. You know, uh, we were not going to go into that. Um, but our diet would have been a lot of hunting and gathering, a lot of gathering of plants. There was not much agriculture. There was no agriculture. We were gathering of plants, wild plants, and there would have been occasional times that you would eat meat. In fact, people would go out and hunt. They'd come back. They they capture an animal. They butcher it up. Butcher it up, you know, eat it, and then, you know, you may go weeks, months before there was more meat. Depending on the place, depending on the part of the earth you were in, uh, but that was the typical diet. Sugar was almost non-existent. Sugar you would only get from fruits, um, and you would only get sugar in a concentrated form uh, if you, you know, came across a beehive, and coming across a beehive was like a big deal, and, you know, human beings developed ways of they figured out pretty quickly after they had fire that they could smoke the beehives and get the beehives down. But having honey would be like something would be like a rare treat, right? So our bodies are adapted to eating a essentially, uh, essentially a low-carb, plant-based, mostly plant-based diet with, with uh, uh, momentary or, you know, periodic uh, you know, sort of feasting of meat, right, with no sugar, no added sugar except for fruit. That's what we are designed to eat. That's what our bodies are designed. That's, that's the design of our bodies. We now live in a society in the Western world, and now almost everywhere else in the world too, but in the Western world specifically, where the things that were very rare when, when, we, when our bodies were being designed by natural selection are now really commonplace. Fat, sugar, you know, meat, meat protein, um, carbohydrates. These are ubiquitous in our society. And because the way we were designed, so if you're out in the savanna in Africa and you came across a beehive full of honey, you know, wow, that's a really rich energy source. And so your body was designed, if you got that rare rich energy source, to, you know, that you would crave it. It would taste really good to you. You would crave it, and then your body would store it <coughs> as fat for using it another day, right? It makes perfect sense. So the people were able to do that, were able to, you know, survive more and have more offspring, so those traits, we've inherited those traits, right? Including the craving for these things, sugar, sweet, uh, uh, meat protein, uh, salt. Salt also not necessarily, food wouldn't have been salty, right? Salt would have been a rare thing, okay? So we crave these things. So we have these bodies that crave these things because they gave us survival advantage when they rarely appeared when we lived in the savanna. But now we live in a society where I drive to Cambridge. And by the way, there's a lot of walking around, right? You know, people weren't driving cars and sitting all day. They were moving around all day, right? Now I get in my car, my floating motorized couch, <laughs> get up from my desk seat, my floating motorized couch. I motor to the, to, you know, Wendy's. And there I have a high carb, you know, french fries that are fried in salty oil with a burger, a huge piece of meat, right? And then I top it off with a sugary milkshake and a hot apple pie, okay? And that's my meal. And so you look around in the Western world and you wonder why people are fat. That's why people are fat. It's, that is very simple to explain. Simple to explain, very difficult to change your behavior patterns because these are programmed into you, okay? They're programmed into you. And so we have all these diets, fad diets, keto diets, paleo diets. You know, the idea of paleo diets and these kind of things are really good. If you did the paleo diet and you really did it like paleo where it was completely plant-based and then, you know, maybe once a month you'd have a steak, you know, it would probably be that would be pretty close to what you were programmed to eat, right? But now that people do the paleo diets, the keto diets, they have like meat every day. They just yeah. meat and vegetables with no carbs, right? I mean, that's kind of the main thing. Well, you, that much meat is not good for you in the long term, yeah. right? in my opinion. Now, you'll find people who disagree with it. But meat in the long term is, once you get over a certain age, eating a lot of meat, you really start noticing it in your body. It, 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 it just strains a lot of your bodily things. Bad for your cardiovascular system, very bad for your kidneys, by the way, right? So a lot of the parts of your body, not good, you know, increased risk of cancer, especially grilled meats. But if you have a steak once a month, eh, 
probably fine, right? So if you are thinking of doing the paleo diet or you're doing it, try to make it more plant-based. There's a lot of evidence plant-based diets are better for you. you know? um, that's pretty incontroversial. I don't think anybody really disagrees much with that. You could argue whether being vegan or you know, non-vegan, you know, you get some arguments about one being a little bit better than the other. But certainly plant-based diets are more healthy. And people who live in places where they eat more plant-based diets and they move around more, I'll give Vietnam as an example, People aren't floating around on their motorized couches all day going to Wendy's. You know, they're moving around, they're eating a diet that's, you know, probably 80% plant-based, you know, with, you know, some carbs, rice. They do eat carbs, they eat rice, and then they have some meat on top of that. They tend to be, you know, um, the, the skinniest, right? But for the longest lived people, by the way, people in third world countries are not the longest lived because they don't get good medical care necessarily go to first world countries where again you have mostly a plant-based diet, um, traditional diet, and then you know a little bit of meat on top of that, and, and maybe not so much red meat. You look at places like that are always in the top top two or three of the longest lived people, you'd find Japan. Japanese some of the longest lived people. They have mostly a plant-based diet with a little fish added to it. Traditionally. As they become more westernized, their longevity is going to go down. That we also see that in places. Yes? Um, what about the type of like fake meat where it's plants? So fake meat is great depending on what it's made out of. I'm mean, we could have a whole lecture about this. Um, like a lot tofu is good. You know, again, plant protein is fine. Um, you know, if you're really into plant protein, you probably need to vary it up a little bit. Tofu, if you eat a lot of tofu all the time, there's soy in that. Th yeah, it's soy. You know, I mean, so there's 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 soy is fine, mm -hmm. uh, but my personal advice would be not to eat it all the time. I eat some soy here, like I have a mostly plant-based diet. I eat soy maybe once or twice a week, you know, and I won't eat more than that. But there's lots of other, pro now we live in this age, of course we live in Southern California, you guys can drive to the Erewhon store in Calabasas and shop with the Kardashians, you know, and you can get all sorts of delicious foods, super expensive, but the pea protein is really becoming common. There's a bunch of other kinds of uh, plant proteins now that are available out there that you can, that you can find. Uh, gluten, you can have gluten protein if you, if you tolerate gluten. Uh, traditionally in Japan it's called seitan, it's very delicious. I don't eat it because I don't eat gluten, but I used to eat it, it's very delicious. If you tolerate gluten, that's a really good one. Uh, there's lots of them out there. And so you have lots of, now the nice thing is now there's lots of choices for, for yeah. plant-based proteins that you can, you, can, you can find. And again, it's not that meat is bad in small amounts. You know, so my diet is I mostly eat plant, I'm not, I'm not holding myself out as any sort of, you know, role model because I barely can keep my weight under control. But my diet is basically mostly plant-based and then, you know, every couple days I'll have a little bit of meat. So I don't eat meat every day. I think that's a good habit. Yes? Do you think that a person's, like, long-term genetic issue can play a part into it? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah of course. Like, uh, people from, like, older countries, like yeah. Eskimo people, or yeah. like uh, yeah. people from Scandinavian countries, they have a harder time eating only plants yeah. because their ancestors survived yeah. almost exclusively off. No, it's true. And it also has to do with the environment. So epigenetics and genetics play a role. And we know like Inuit people, and, you know, Eskimo people, you know, they, they tend to eat, their diets just mostly meat because that's all, they have. that's all they have up there. And they find that in some cases they have very low cases of, of uh, cardiovascular disease and everything. But again, they're outside in the cold moving around, burning a lot of energy. They're not floating. When they start driving their floating couches, then they start getting problems. So again, you know, that is, that is you know, yes, all these things play a role. Genetics, epigenetics, environment, all play a role here. Right. Anybody ever lived in the cold? Anybody lived in a cold place? I used to live, I went to graduate school in Illinois. It was like 80 below zero outside. You wanted a steak. People drank, ate steaks and, and drank whiskey in the winter because, you know, whiskey was like antifreeze, you know. And you wanted, you needed that meat. Dra walking outside to drain your body of energy. And so you, I, I felt I wanted to eat a lot more meat in a place like that. You know, I go to Hawaii and I'm out in the, you know, sunshine, it's tropical, it's warm, it's nice out, you know, I don't really feel much need to eat much meat there. A little fish, this fish is good, right? but not much meat, yeah. Wouldn't you, I mean, I feel like we've gotten more health conscious recently. In California, you live in the bubble, yeah, by the well, way. Yeah. Well, you live in the bubble, the Kardashian Calabasas bubble here where you live. But as far as like yeah. obesity, are the stats still the same that the U.S. is still? 
Yeah. You, I, I'll show you the stats I have. I'll show those. Yeah, we're we we're, we're on we're the top two. I'll show you the stats. And, and the stats I have are a little outdated. Um, so yes, but on, on the whole, on the whole, if you take the West Coast bubble, you know the LA, the LA, you know, and New York, you know, health conscious, you know, yoga minded people bubble out of the equation. It's really a very small number. On, on the whole, we're super fat. Yeah. And again, um, and again, you know, people from other parts of the world look at us and go, "Wow, that's really culture balancing." You guys have, you know. And again, a lot of it has to do with the mechanization of food, the, the rise of fast food, which, by the way, was invented right here in Southern California. First McDonald's was square down there in Pasadena somewhere. Um, you know, it was invented here. You know, we are at the heart of the invention of fast food. Here. So I'm not saying never eat fast food, but you know, I would just say, you know, it's like you wouldn't want a Christmas stocking every day. You know, make you know, it's nice to have it one day a year in Christmas. It makes it special. Fast food ought to be thought of like a Christmas stocking. Right. This is a guy named Man Manuel uh, Ortiz, something like that. I can't remember his last name. He was at one point the fattest man in the world. Um, he weighed about a thousand pounds. In order to move him to the hospital, they had to put him. They had to lift him up on a specially made bed and crane him into a flatbed truck. Um, nevertheless, he, some women fell in love with him and he got married. So that's another thing. Um, Talk about uh, but he died. Uh, uh, he was trying to lose weight. He died, um, uh, and so you'll find people. He probably had some genetic variation causing him to put on weight. You'll find people in extreme obesity. But again, it's like an addiction. You know, sugar, fat. You know, these are like things we're like we, we have a built-in addiction to them, and so we all have to modulate our addiction a little bit. You know, I mean that's the hard part, right? Do you think that? Um that it would be beneficial, I mean, you'd probably say yes, but for us to have like a mandatory health class, well, I didn't really realize what I was putting into my body my senior year at my community college, and that was yeah. like only a couple of years yeah. ago. I personally think education is good. I think when you start mandating things, you know, I, I tend to be a little more libertarian I know, about things. Not you know, I don't know about mandating things, but I do think I think it's a good idea for all everybody to learn a little bit about nutrition. Yeah. I put my public health health you know hat on, and I think it's really good in general. But the other thing is that we're finding that these in you know having high meat based diets and sugar based diets are really bad for our environment. Yeah. Right. Meat production causes you know it definitely contributes to global warming. It may not be as much as the floating couches that we drive around. And I'm guilty, you know. I have a car, it's literally a floating couch. It's really, really comfortable. It's more comfortable than my couch at home, yeah. you know. Uh, so I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody, you know. But, you know, I mean, I, I, think, I think, you know, those kind of things are, are I, think it, I think knowledge is power. Right? Yeah. So the more you know, the more you take knowledge. And then you make a choice. You know, oh, I'm going to slowly commit suicide by eating McDonald's every day, right? You also that movie Supersize Me? Yeah, yeah. Right? That's a really interesting movie. All right. Uh, here's an article. Sugar brand of poison calls for tax and regulation. Well, we you know we regulate cigarettes. We tax cigarettes because we know they kill people, and they, and they end up putting a lot of people in the hospital. So why don't we tax sugar? Sugar is just as bad. That's caused just as many problems. We have an epidemic of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, which is acquired. Uh, because of all the sugar that we eat. So, you know, to think about. These are all things worth thinking about. Obesity rates, this is a little bit older. We were number one when this was done, but I think I think we're not number one now. I think we're it's usually US, Mexico, and the and, and, and Britain. We usually buy for number one. Interestingly enough, some places where they have high you know, where they where they eat meat and eat other things are really actually not so bad. Look at Germany. Anybody eating German food? Mm -hmm. German food is pretty heavy, and yet they only have 13 percent. Um, and you can see some other countries here which seem a little weird. Uh, Italy, they eat a huge amount of pasta. Yeah, they have a huge carb-based diet, and yet people in Italy overall are pretty skinny. And also the kind of food they make, like they don't have, they're not so having gluten and all this other stuff. Oh, it's to totally pasta. full of gluten. Are you kidding? Or it's, well, also, it's all gluten. It's like a different. The no. Plant they use again. No. It's not any different. Same pasta you get here. But the lady have a lot of fresh food. They grow a lot of their own food. A lot of the vegetables yeah. are grown at home. They eat a lot of fresh food, a lot of prepared food, not a lot of fast food. Yeah. Uh, Italy's wheat, what we would consider heirloom wheat here, you 
because like it's not as genetically You go you buy Italian pasta in a store here. It's the, I love it's the same. Yes, okay. you can buy heirloom wheat pasta and people claim it's better for you. Yeah. Right. Oh my god. It, you know, the on the on the carb basis it doesn't matter. You know, carb wise it doesn't matter. So they do pretty well. And you look at Norway, they eat, you know, meat, but it's very cold there. Japan, you know, now you get down here, Japan, Korea, uh, Vietnam, uh, you know. Very, very low rates of So again, lots of interesting things here. Um, I can show you some other slides. Uh, again, you look at here, again, you know, United States is, and Mexico tend to be at the top. Uh, obesity seems to be increasing worldwide. This is just the United States, but you know, people as, as more countries adopt the Western diet. But even in the last 20, you know, 30 years or so, we can really see more, more obesity here. And they're defining, you know, obesity and anything over 30 is obese, and then you know, over 50 yeah. is morbidly obese. And you see, this is increasing. So things have not been getting better, at least up until the year 2000. So um, I, I need to find a newer version of this, but you can see things are not getting better. So maybe we do need a class in this that you should all take. I what do you think? What's your take on BMI? Yeah, just wondering. BMI is there, it, it, it's it's the problem with BMI is not a great it depends how it's measured. It's not the yeah. greatest measurement. So there's, there's different ways of measuring it. So it's not it's not it's not specifically accurate, yeah. but it, it's 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 sort of a useful general yeah. number. Okay. I thought it was like. I don't know, my neuroscience teacher brought up a good point because she's always bad on her weight. Yeah. But like, she, and she's above, or yeah, more above her um, BMI. Yeah. yeah. But yet she's super healthy. Some so, people, like, you know, it depends how it's measured. Some, in some ways of measuring it will count muscle. Yeah. And so you can be real muscular and have a high BMI. It just depends how it's measured. There are sophisticated ways of measuring it though, okay. where you can just get to the fat and, you know. Yeah. Using BMI, like I've always been obese in my weight or my height class. Yeah. 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 It's a calculated thing. So again, it's just it's just a general measure. I mean, obviously, you want to figure out what's going on with you health-wise. You go to your doctor and nutritionist, and you figure out what's yeah. going on. They can do some other tests for you. And besides, they're a little more specific. But you know, in general, this is giving you a general idea. Yeah. Okay. And again, you can see this is the uh, longest lived people. I think this is fairly accurate. I think Hong Kong was the last I looked at it was the longest lived people were in Hong Kong, which is really interesting. Uh, but again, you know, you know, uh, a, a, a traditional, mostly plant-based diet. Uh, Japan is always in the top. And actually, Japan is, uh, women in Japan live the longest, I think, of any place in the world. So for females, uh, Japan is the longest lived people. For males, the second longest lived. These are the average ages. You see the United States is way down here. United wow. States, on average, people are living four to six years uh, uh, longer. So again, you know, four to six years may not seem much to you guys now at your age, but when you get my age, it seems like a long time. So. Um, But you know, the other thing is you also got to take medical care into account here too. Yeah. Notice New Zealand, which has a very high meat diet. You know, people live pretty long in New Zealand. You know, they have a pretty high meat diet. But again, they're eating a lot of fresh food. They're eating a lot of non-processed food, not a lot of fat food. We didn't even talk about like processing and chemicals in food. Yeah. That's a whole other thing. We yeah. need to do. I don't want to spend the whole time talking about this because, and you'll see the word world total is really down. That's because you have a lot of people in third world countries that aren't getting medical care. Yeah. And you notice the United States isn't on this list, right? And part of the United States is because people aren't getting medical care. If people, if we had more universal medical care in the United States, I'm being political here. I will be political on things. I do believe everybody should have access to medical care. Uh, but you know, that's the only political thing I'm going to say. But you'll see part of the reason we're down here is because of that. Yes. Uh, a friend of mine, she came from uh, Japan. And as soon as she got here, after like a week of yeah. eating our food, she just started breaking out. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the typical thing that happens yeah. to people. Um, if you go to Japan and eat their food, though, the same. I went to Japan and I had breakfast, and I I broke out. It was bright red. Something I was allergic really? to. Something in the. I ate the pickles. Something in the pickles I was allergic to, and I 
turns out right. So yes, there's always adjustments to me, but mm -hmm. generally in Japan, you can go and eat anything, you don't get sick. Yeah, you can go. Uh -huh. it's the other way around is when you need they have, they have fast food in Japan now, too, by the way. And so yeah. they're starting to have the, you know, they'll end up having the same problem. We'll see if they, if they go down on the list for that. All right. Uh, you'll see other countries there. Again, I'm not, I'm not being, being a little political here. You see Sweden up there. Sweden has a pretty Western diet. They have really good medical care. Yeah, you see these countries up there. Canada's up pretty high, you know. Canadians aren't that much different than we are. They just have much better medical care. So, from access to medical care. Medical care itself isn't better, the access is better. Anyway, so you can take a look at this. All right.